Good morning, folks. Great to see everyone here. So yeah, so I'm going to talk about event-driven data pipelines. So what, when you think about event-driven, what do folks think of? Yeah, publish and subscribe. A anything else? Irregular schedules. Anything else? Low latency, great call out. Anything else? API calls, yes, exactly, the, which everyone loves. Everyone loves a good API call. Wonderful, absolutely. So we're going to discuss a lot of those things today. I'm going to do that through a little bit of, uh, little bit of sort of a, a little metaphorical, anecdotal sort of way, and then we'll talk into, we'll get into a sort of a, a sample sort of way you might want to build a data pipeline in an event-driven way. And then we'll really get into a few examples. So I'm actually going to dare to do live demos, and that way, if it breaks, please be kind. I'm going to warn you in advance, I'm on a hotel network, who knows? Anything can happen. But I'm hoping for the best. And uh, we'll see how that goes from here. But I'm going to start out with a bit more of a metaphor. So for most of human history, if you want to get across a river, a valley, anything else like that, you'd build a big old stone bridge, right? So you would you'd, you know, build it. By the way, does anyone know where this is? Oh, I was going to have bonus points for anyone that got this. This is the uh, Ponte Pietra in uh, Verona, Italy. So obviously no Italians in the room, oh, that's unfortunate. So, because if, if, if you were from Italy and got it right, I was going to take points away. So it's fine, it all works out evenly. So yeah, so, you know, this, this worked out great, right? You just build a pile of rocks across from A to B, you, you know, and, and it obviously works. This is, you know, Roman era, it's a couple thousand years old. It's sturdy, it does what it's done, it's done what it's done for years. But there are a few limitations, right? First of all, it, there's a limitation in scale. You can only build a stone bridge so far. At a certain point, you just can't get it any further. It takes so much material and so much effort to get it from one place to another, it just can't make it. And also at scale, it becomes very brittle, right? At a very large scale, a stone bridge is just going to collapse upon its own weight. And speaking of collapsing, something that's made of stone has a very fixed capacity, right? This bridge, maybe you can get 25 elephants on it, but after that 26 elephant, it'll just all of a sudden collapse. There's no give, there's no, you know, there's no uh, ability for it to sort of ease and flow and ebb and flow with the other things that are being used. So it only took, you know, up, up till about, uh, about 150 years ago before they came up with a solution. So everyone knows where this bridge is. It's literally on your badge. So hopefully you remember where this is. It's literally around the corner. So this is, of course, the Golden Gate Bridge. So when they were going to build this bridge, first of all, a lot of people thought this was impossible. The, the Golden Gate, the strait that this goes through is almost two kilometers long. It has extraordinarily vicious tides that come through it because the entire San Francisco Bay pours through this strait at least twice a day. It's very deep. It's, uh, I think, over, it's over 100 meters deep. There are incredibly harsh winds that go through here. Uh, all the time. So when it's not foggy here, it's windy, you get one or the other. And then of course we have California's favorite thing, earthquakes, because sometimes the ground isn't where you expected it to be. So a lot of people said you couldn't build this thing. Too far, too many, too much, it required too much flexibility, too much ebb and flow, too much of all these things to work. But they finally settled on, the, the final design was a guy, I'll get the name right, Leon Mousseff. Uh, Mark, I'm probably saying that wrong. Leon Mousseff is the engineer. He actually built the Manhattan Bridge in New York. And he's the one that built this. And he came up with this idea, uh, I don't think it was necessarily his, but he had this theory about deflection theory. The idea was that you know, if, if the bridge can give a little bit in one place and then let go in a little bit another, you can achieve much more uh, um, scale and resiliency with far less material. And it, became, it ended up being very efficient. So at the end of the day, he was able to build this. It was released in 1937. Uh, and at the time, it was the longest and tallest suspension bridge. It was the longest until 1964 and the tallest until up, way up until 1998. Uh, and its whole span, it's 1,280 meters long, and it's, uh, the tower height is uh, 227 meters. So obviously, this was you'd never be able to do this with something stone, right? You couldn't just build a stone bridge across the strait and expect it to work. So, you can take a similar philosophy to the way you're building your data pipelines, right? So an event-driven architecture is really taking your fixed data pipeline, your fixed structure, that old stone bridge that has a fixed capacity and can only scale so far, and transforming those, that, those sort of connections, those bridges, into something like the Golden Gate Bridge, something that's got flex and it's got the ability to give and take with the winds and the tides, 
and God forbid the earthquakes, which hopefully that does not happen while we're here. I'm not ready for that. Um, you know, but it, it's able to give and take and be able to do that as, as it goes, right? So, you know, when we think of event-driven architectures, we're really looking at the idea of, you know, how do we create these detachments, right? In the case of an event, it's really representing a difference in state, right? Something's appeared, something's disappeared, uh, something has changed, right? And if that event can take with it enough information to tie one, when in this case, one shore to the next, one bridge there, one section to the next, it has the ability to create this very flexible, scalable, and effective architecture. So the way I've set up the example today is to really, it's a super simple example. By the way, I am a product manager. I'm not a software developer. Please don't laugh at my code. I apologize in advance. It's as good as I'm able to do on, on, you know, with the, 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 the abilities I have. But regardless, hopefully it's enough to illustrate the point. So the idea here in this example is we have some change. Something has happened. So in my example, someone's going to drop a file in a, in, in, into a file system. We need to figure out what changed, right? So we've got to somehow list that content. We've got to take that reference, turn it into a list of information, and then we need to create some sort of context. Here's the, here's the information that lets you do something with that data. And then finally, we need to actually process the data. Otherwise, what was the point in doing all the rest of the steps, right? There was no point in doing that. So, in this case, full disclosure, I do work in AWS, so therefore I'm using AWS stuff because they give it to me. Otherwise, you know, this exact same thing will work exactly the same on Azure and Google and on your, uh, your self-managed stuff and everything else. It's all the same. It just happens I have access to these things, so that's what I'm using. So in this case, the setup, I've achieved that thing with some very simple components. So I've got an S3 bucket, which I assume everyone knows what that is, even if you don't use AWS, because I think that's pretty much everywhere. Amazon MWA, which is just Airflow, it's just open source Airflow. And then I'm using an open source processing, which is based on Trino and, and, and Presto, which is Amazon Athena, which is just basically gives me a, a serverless way to, to take the data and do something with it. Right? It doesn't really matter what these things are, but really you have a source, something to process it, and something new. So if I'm saying, okay, I've got files that are landing in the left-hand side, and I want them to do something in the right-hand side and have Airflow do it, there's a fairly simple way that the first thing you would think of in Airflow is, well, let's just, let's just have a sensor on the bucket, right? Just look when stuff's there, just keep reading it, and when there's stuff there, do something with it. And not surprisingly, because Airflow's been doing this for 10 years, that works just fine, right? So I've got in here an Airflow set up. I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna enable this. You'll see why I had disabled in a second. But I'm gonna go through and enable this, so I've got it running on my uh, and my uh, local airflow here. So continuous, apologize for, again, I misspelled continuous, that's really bad. Yeah, there's no points for spelling, so I'm okay. So I've got a very simple little thing here that's going to simply copy a bunch of files to an S3 bucket. Yep, nothing fancy, just copying a bunch of files to a, to a location in S3 that it knows to go through, and then this thing's gonna happily refresh until it, it finds that information, right? So we'll just let it keep refreshing, it'll come up, and just to show you what it's doing, let me pull up the actual code for this thing. So here's again my poorly spelled uh, file. So to do this, I'm doing fairly simple tasks. The first is I'm getting a list of the queries that I need. So I've got a variable that I'm setting that says, here's the last file that each, here's the last file age. Honestly, you'd probably do like a file hash or something that's a little more accurate than this. So if you had things that landed at the same time, they wouldn't, but I did it the simple way. I'm storing the last time that we're, or retrieving the last file that was processed. I'm going to that bucket, I'm going to pull all the files filtered by that location, and everything that's a bigger than the uh, date time, I'm going to append it to the list of these, these keys, these files that I'm going to return. Once I've returned those keys, I'm going to read the data from them, which is this simple read, read, read key from S3, and then I'm going to pass it to Athena. And the way I'm doing that is I'm using, everyone hopefully knows uh, uh, map tasks, dynamic task mapping. So I've gone through and the first, the first uh, function is simply going to get a list of those keys. I'm gonna pass it to the second function that's gonna expand on them and read the data from each key. And each resulting read is gonna be passed to my operator. In this case, it's that Athena operator, right? So if I go back to Airflow, it's happily doing exactly that. You can see that if I look at this particular task, and look at my graph. It's happily running, you can see I dumped 25 files in there. 
all the data has been retrieved and it's happily passing this along to, to our, our uh, in this case, our data processing, our Presto engine, to do the, the SQL magic on it. But there's a slight issue with the way I've done this. And it should be fairly obvious looking at it, but let me go ahead and set this to 100. When I do that, there's a whole bunch of runs that did a whole lot of nothing. All they're doing is reading from the bucket saying, oh, nothing here. I'm reading from the bucket saying, mm, nothing here. Right? It's a extraordinarily inefficient way to, it's absolutely effective. It works. You can see it happily processed the 25 files I dumped in there. It works like a charm. But it's really inefficient. Really inefficient. And so if we go back to what we had you know, set up, looked at here, right? It's because I have these rigid structures in between each one, each of those steps, right? I have a rigid structure that detects a step. It's a function that's going to continuously run. And again, it wouldn't matter if you ran every minute or five minutes or hour. It's the same scale, right? It's just a matter of scale, but the functionality is the same. You're doing a bunch of runs that you don't know if there's something there or not. So you're, you've got this rigid structure between finding that something's changed and getting that lift. You've got the rigid structure of actually creating the context from that because it's going to keep reading it and it's, it's part of the exact same, um, exact same definition data pipeline. And then, of course, we've created this very stru rigid structure of taking those tasks and mapping them, whether there's zero tasks or there's, in this case, 25 tasks or there's 2,500 tasks. Right? Everything is all rigidly locked together. So what can we do to start to turn these sort of stone structures into something a little bit more flexible? So. One option right away is saying, well, let's forget about this constant loop because that's really inefficient. Can we do something more event driven? So fortunately, in the case of, uh, you know, spoiler, this is one of the reasons I picked S3 to do this. S3 has the ability to just simply let a notification happen when something lands in there. And you can do this with file systems and you can do this with, uh, you know, basically everything has the ability to say, hey, something changed. So no problem. You know what? I'm going to not rely on Airflow to do this constant loop thing. I'm going to wait for it, something to tell it what to do. So. If we look at what that looks like, so very simply in this case, again, I apologize, I'm using AWS for this. It's just what I have access to. It works very similar elsewhere. It's just they let me have it. They let me play with it. It's, you know, you play with the toys in the box. So in this case, I've simply created a little trigger. Reads from S3. It's got a, it's, it's got a bucket. I've got a prefix for it. If I go back to my handy dandy little, little utility that I created and I send it, not surprisingly, if I go to number one, right, I can dump a bunch of files in there, and this will happily read those files, files as they come in. And then what I did was, in my Lambda code, I'm simply going through and saying, well, I'm just going to use the REST API in Airflow. Right? So I'll just trigger it and say, here, you know, here, every time I get to see a file, send, the rest, send to the REST API, I'll trigger that, the DAG, and say, here's my file. So I've got an MWA environment name. Again, just open source Airflow is just running on AWS. I'm calling the, the plain old REST API endpoint. I'm passing it a configuration, which is just strictly, you know, here's the file name that was created. I'm going to give it some information like the destination that I want to use. But other than that, I'm just passing it. This is the context that changes. So this is that identifier part of the event-driven architecture, right? You can't just create an event. You've got to create some identifier that ties the information together. So in this case, I'm using the S3 key because that's, that's the one thing that's relevant. So if we go look at what that looks like, right? So we've got, you can see a whole bunch of things running here. Fantastic, it worked. Again, always impressed when things work on a live demo. So, you know, be suitably impressed that things are happening. So things are happening. This is great. Looks, looks fantastic. What's the problem? What could possibly be the problem? Well, the problem is when I look at the Lambda, it has no contact, concept of airflow. It doesn't know what it's talking to. It's just saying, hey, a file showed up. I'm going to go call this API trigger. It doesn't know if I have a huge web server that can handle a bunch of commands, or it has a tiny web server that maybe can handle one at a time. It has no concept. It'll just happily just send it along, right? So again, live demo. I'm not sure if this is going to work. We'll see. When I run the query on this, you can see that, well, it turns out a few of my call calls failed. And why they fail? Because it was calling, it was basically the Lambda was working as fast as S3 could work. It was happily calling APIs like crazy. And the web server ran, ran out of bandwidth. Right? So we just simply, we, we've, we've, we fixed one part of the problem, but we've also now, we've created, we still have inflexibilities elsewhere. So when we look at what that looks like, if I go back to my little diagram here, right? 
we've created flexibility in that first bit, right? We no longer have this really rigid loop constantly looking for stuff, but now we run into that next bit of flexibility, right? It's it's having to call this this REST API to Airflow, and it and the thing that's triggering doesn't have any concept, doesn't have any flexibility in how it's calling it. It's just going to simply send that herd of elephants, whether somebody can handle it or not. So no problem. We'll one step at a time, we're gonna fix this a little bit. So instead of just doing this wide open lambda that just happily blindly does this, I'm gonna add a queue into the mix. Right, this is a pretty standard event driven practice which says I'm not just gonna blindly send stuff. I'm gonna create a mechanism that allows me to do it in an orderly fashion at a certain rate. So again, I'm using SQS in this case because it's AWS but I can do anything I want. You know, this could be Redis or whatever. Like, there's lots of ways to queue things. That's not terribly unique. So. When I look at that, right, so all I've done is in my little S3 bucket, I've created the object type creations, and if I scroll down, I've just told it to send it to an SQS queue. I'm just saying, okay, don't just send, don't just tell Lambda to start executing on this. Send it to a queue where I can be a little bit more orderly about this thing. Right, I'm creating that flexibility. I'm going from this rigid structure to a flexible structure by just queuing the events first. And then in Lambda, I'm using an SQS trigger instead of that file trigger. And importantly, I've put a, what's nice about that is I can put a concurrency in, right? Because they're queued, I'm not obliged to pull them all at once. I can pull them whenever I want. So what I've done here is I've said, only give me 10 at a time. Now again, I just picked that number, it depends on what your infrastructure looks like or whatever, but that was, a, that was the easy number for me to put in there. I'm only gonna make 10 API, REST API calls to Airflow at a time. So if I go back to my, handy dandy little test thing here. Don't laugh, but this is gonna be like number, test number two. I did zero indexing because of course I did. Right, so it's gonna go through and write all that stuff. And again, it's gonna to go to the same, the, the same DAG that I had previously. So if I go back and, and show you, it's gonna be the exact same uh, DAG interface. It's actually gonna be the same as this one here. Again, we'll see if my network's coming up. See, it's, it's not responding very quickly. That's not good. There we go. And so here you can see, and if you look, there's actually a few tasks that are still in the, in the queued state here. Because now we got them all into Airflow at once and Airflow was able to better process it because I wasn't dumping a bunch of, of uh, REST API calls that failed, right? I've got, you know, it was doing it in orderly fashion. I've built in some elasticity in between the bit that says something changed and the bit that has to act on that change. And so now if I go to my query, and again, Assuming this worked correctly, not surprisingly, no records, no failures, right? So I did that same error query, query against the, the second lambda I did in the first one, but this time everything worked exactly as expected. And so this is just a, this is sort of the process by taking the, you know, thinking of how you have this, this rigid structure and how you end up going to something that's a lot more flexible. So when we look at what we've done there, so we start out with this sort of rigid structure in between all of these, these, these elements. So the detection change, we solved that fairly straightforward. We went to, to uh, uh, in this case, S3, the, our object storage sends an event when something changes. We have it go to a queue so we can act, act on it whenever we'd like to. And then we can then, at, at, at our leisure, pull from that queue and send that to Airflow. But there's still another bit here is that Lambda, even though we've, we've told it how often it can talk to the API, you saw that I just basically said, okay, I'm gonna put a certain essentially throttle on it. I'm gonna say, don't make more calls than this, that way I can have the, the, the queue that's coming in flex in the wind or in the, in, you know, and have a nice steady output on from the other side. But that Lambda still doesn't know what Airflow's doing. It doesn't know how busy Airflow is. How does it know, it, again, this is event driven, odds are you're not using Airflow for one thing. It's probably doing something else at the same time. It's probably running a bunch of other stuff that is scheduled. Some of them may be really complicated. So Lambda's happily just telling Airflow, trigger, 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 but it doesn't know what Airflow's doing. It doesn't have any way to make it more efficient in the way Airflow's working. So how can we allow Airflow to breathe? How can we allow Airflow to do that? Well, one thing we can do is instead of this bit where we're triggering the DAG, where we're blindly calling an API that just says, you know, run this DAG Airflow, don't, don't ask any questions, just run the DAG, please. Instead, we can leverage something that's come out relatively recently in Airflow, and that is data sets. Data sets are fantastic, because you know what the difference is? Instead of me telling Airflow, run this DAG, I'm just telling Airflow, hey, this, this information changed.
and let Airflow figure out when it's ready to run. So the advantage there is when we go to the way Airflow is running this, right? So I've got exactly the same general trigger. So I'm using that the, the same same concept I had before, where I have an SQS trigger, it's still throttling it because I still need to worry about, make sure Airflow's REST API isn't overloaded, right? So we still need to add that elasticity in there. But instead, if I look at the code I'm running, instead of me just saying, trigger this DAG Airflow, run, run this workflow with this information, I'm taking the exact same information I was creating that has a bucket and a key and all the context that it needs, but I'm triggering a data set instead with it. And by triggering data set, what I mean is I'm setting a data set event. So if we look at the API calls, has anyone worked with the data set events before? A few folks, excellent. Um, so I'm just saying set this data set event. And really under the hood, at, at the risk of dramatically oversimplifying it, Airflow's creating a database record. That's it. It's just creating a database record with some information in it. But the power in that is that this is a database record that the Airflow scheduler knows all about. And it's able to go and look at it and say, okay, uh, I'm going to go through and, and next time I'm going through my scheduler loop and I'm, and I'm at the point in my scheduler loop where it says, any new data set events? It's going to go to that table and it's going to go through and say, okay, oh, there are some data set events. Let me go do something with them. And there's a couple of advantages of the way Airflow does that. One is you get this super cool data set view. So if I go through and let me go back to my zero index test number three and copy a bunch of information to that data set folder. Right? So as data, data is updated in here, we get this really nice data set view of it. So I can see the associated DAGs. If I had more than one DAG with this, I could see that. But I can see all the data set. In this case, it's named after the S3 bucket. By the way, it doesn't have to be. It, there are some restrictions. It can't be called Airflow colon slash slash. But honestly, Airflow mostly just uses this as a text string. You can use the content. You can use your resource name. But you could use anything you want, actually. But let's me go through and say all these things that have started up. And so I can go through and see all the context that was passed. Right? So I can go through and filter it. Not a big deal with just one DAG, but what about when you have 50 DAGs going off the same data set, or 100 DAGs? And they're all, and maybe you have 50 or 100 different data sets. Right? This one view within Airflow is going to let you actually monitor and see what data is being updated from where. But also, this lets me run the view from the actual DAG itself. So you can see here, it's, there's the on, so we can see our next run is on that data set. And then again, if you click on that, it's just going to take you to the data set view, not surprisingly. But we can go through and see all these data sets that's running. Now, you might, if you're looking closely, you're like, well, there's only 11. Wasn't there like 25 files on there? Why is there only 11 or so? Well, if we scroll, if we scroll over and click on one of these, you can see that each of these runs is not necessarily one event. Because Airflow is smart enough to say, I'm not going to create a new DAG run for every data set event for a DAG that needs it. I'm going to take all the events that happened since the last time it ran and run them all. So Airflow naturally batches together these events at its rate. So if the Airflow scheduler is really busy, there might be 30 events in, at, at once because it's busy doing other things. And if it's not busy at all, you might get one data set. So, one, so you get all these multiple events. So you can see this particular DAG run. And if I go click on them, you'll see there's different data set runs. So this one's got one. This one's got, you know, there's a few that have one. Let's see if I can find a few more with two. Let me go back to this one. So it's, it, you know, they have different, so different data set events. So this one's got three. So that's different. And what I did for the code base for this, if we go back to our Visual Studio code, is I kind of combined, you know, in that sort of the one that was just a single tenant event, you know, I was just strictly doing, you know, it, it gets the query source parameter. And it, you know, it gets that data from the query source parameter, it passes it to my Athena operator, and just runs it. But because the data set event might be one thing, it might be many things, I actually combined this with what's happening in the first example where I was using a dynamic task mapping. So I can go through and say, for my query day, I'm going to go through and, and use a few different techniques in here at once. So one is my get queries now, I'm not just blindly reading from S3. I'm using the triggered data set events. This is a reserve parameter, right, that comes in. It's got the, the, it's reserved based upon the templating that we have in Airflow. And I'm going through and saying for each of the data set and data set, or the, basically pulling the data set list or events, right, all the items that came out of that. And for each one of those, I'm appending 
that query source that I'm returning back way back from the Lambda operation. So if I go through and look at our data set, you can see here, that's that config I was passing in as extra. That is coming all the way in and landing in Airflow under this d.extra. Right? That's the extra parameters that you pass into your data set events. And so by having those extra parameters in there, I can, this is now aware of that list that was in the, being passed to the, the particular DAG run, right? So in this case, there's three, so I would get a list output if I look at the graph view of this, this run. Not surprisingly, there's three of them. And you can see the data set is feeding into it. And then we have that function that pulls the list of queries and it's returning back three queries because it was three associated with the data set events. And this is giving Airflow that flexibility to say, oh, you know what? The last time I went through this, there was only one event there. And remember, I'm creating all these events all at once, right? So it's, it's dumping them all in. I tend to making them, doing them at batches of 10 because I'm queuing them, but reasonably they're running pretty quickly. And Airflow, the reason I Airflow is only getting them at onesie, twosie, threesies is because it's not doing anything else. But odds are your Airflow is probably doing tons and it probably has lots of other things that it wants to do. And so this way there may be 100 events that have accumulated since the last time you run it, but it doesn't matter because we're able to just run through them at whatever leisure. And the nice thing about the dynamic task mapping in Airflow is it's extraordinarily efficient, right? Because the, the scheduler doesn't really care about it. It's essentially just dumping this list over to the workers and they just happily run them. It's a very efficient way. So you're essentially buying this extra flexibility. If the, if the scheduler is busy, it's gonna do more work on the worker side as dynamic tasks. And if it's not terribly busy, it's gonna do more work on the scheduler side as individual DAG runs. But either way, it's working as quickly as it can in the as most timely way as it can. And of course, you can take advantage, as you can see, when I was doing um, the, the data set event here, right, I'm just populating it with arbitrary, an arbitrary JSON, right? This can be whatever context you need to place along with it. It can be as complicated as you need to. I would probably, I'm sure there is a uh, limit in the amount of data. You're not gonna throw like an entire file in there. That's sort of not the point of EDA anyways. It's all about providing a reference to the data you need. But you're able to get that level of flexibility. And so now, when I run this, Right? I'm able to rely on this in a timely way, be able to work at Airflow schedule at its own efficiency at whatever level we want. So when we go back to our structure, this is the sort of the final leg of that, that flexibility between all these different sort of, of islands we're trying to communicate from, right? We've taken that flexibility of, hey, we're no longer statically pulling events. We're waiting for the event to come to us. We've then had the flexibility of saying, we're not obliged to start firing these events off to Airflow as soon as they come in, we're adding a queue in there. We're gonna let, let Airflow give, you know, we're gonna be able to accommodate, act as a sort of a shock absorber, right? If a bunch come in at once, we can, the queue gets a little bit bigger. As there's more time, the queue gets smaller. And then we've let Airflow make the final decision about when it's gonna actually schedule these things, which means that no matter how many events I create in this context, no matter how many events I throw to it, Airflow is never obliged to try and do more than it's able to do. Because the Airflow scheduler will just happily pick up those events and run them and say, okay, I now, today, you know, this run, I have seven events and I'm gonna go through and dump all those for my dynamic task. And so you've managed to create this level of flexibility and elasticity that no matter which, you know, which component is currently active in that, you have the ability to absorb those issues, the, 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 those differences. And that's really a key part of it's the moment you open up to being event driven in something, the moment you say that, hey, I'm relying on something externally to decide what I have to do, you got to think about, okay, what can that external system do? How is it going to break me? How can I make it so that I, you know, I, I've insulated the different components? By the way, I'm impressed. I went through that whole demo and everything worked on a hotel network. So, I mean, bravo, bravo to the Westin for a great network. I'm impressed with that. Fantastic. Okay, so let's go over just sort of the events in this. So first of all, what are the benefits of this, this structure? The, the first one is really to scale and fail independently, right? Each, as we looked at those different bits and pieces of that event-driven structure, you know, if a whole bunch, if a thousand files land in the S3, it's happily able to scale that up through that queuing mechanism and it can build as much of them independently without affecting the rest of the system, right? It's able to pass that through it. And similarly, if Airflow is busy doing other scheduled tasks, it's able to accumulate those, those events without it affecting itself. Each, each component is able to react independently on its own. There's also another benefit for, because I assume many of the people in the room are developers, it's a really good development pattern. Because you know what? 
The person that was writing the stuff that did the event stuff doesn't need to know anything about what the data pipeline is doing on the Airflow side. And the people that are writing the communication between the, you know, the, uh, the, in this case, the Lambda to Airflow, that's just a generic component. You can build and test these components independently. In fact, you know, when I look at when I was doing the, um, you know, the, the building of this, right, uh, if I go through and show an example here, when I'm writing my test for this, I can take just the same event JSON that, that AW, or that in this case S3 was sending to me and build it as my Lambda test. And I can click that button all day long and I don't actually have to copy files all over the place. Uh, it's cooler when I do, but I don't have to do that. I can just click this and test it out and see if it's working. So I'm able to unit test each of these components in my architecture without having to test this whole big long data pipeline all at once. Now there's other ways to do that in Airflow and hopefully everyone's taking advantage of the ways you can do that in Airflow, but this is another a benefit of these, these pieces that are detached. It also allows you to build extensible systems because there's nothing to say that each one of those the data set events is going to the same Airflow cluster. What does it care, right? It could be going to many Airflow clusters. You could build an entire load balancing system that says, hey, that Airflow is busy and this Airflow has got tons of time, right? So I can just send it wherever. And because it's an event-driven architecture, because the events contain the context of what it's doing, the, all the information it needs comes along for the ride with the event identifier, right? So you don't need to know that uh, oh, well, Airflow cluster three is processing this one, and it doesn't matter, because it's it, everything I did here, if there was 10 Airflows, it would work exactly the same. So you can now build this, this extensible system that's very detached and, and you know, idempotent to each individual element of it without really caring about what the, you know, having to know this stateful information. Now, reduce complexity. So it does reduce complexity in that you're less, in this sort of architecture, you're less likely to have one of those DAGs that goes on for like two, you know, 5,000 lines. I'm sure a few people probably have one in there that looks like that. You don't have to put your hands up. I don't won't put you on the spot. But I'm sure there's probably a few in the audience that have some DAGs that you know, it takes a little while to figure out what it's doing, right? This is very modular. This is like, by its definition, it's all detached. You, you really can't build these giant monolithic structures in an event-driven architecture. It's not meant for that. It's meant for microservices and small things small units of work that you can discreetly pass from one step to the next. Auditing is really easy, and, and not just auditing in, that, in the way of developing, in far as saying, oh, what's this system doing, what's that system doing? You've now detached the airflow cluster that I have here. It doesn't necessarily need to be able to have list access to that S3 bucket. It doesn't need to know that. I've got the Lambda needed that, right? You can now build isolation of different components. You can say this component is allowed to access these things, and that component's allowed to access those things. The only thing I'm passing to Airflow, it needs to be able to read the object that I tell it. It doesn't need to list the objects, it doesn't need to do anything else, it just needs to do the one piece of information it needs. So it allows you to build, you know, follow the security practices of, you know, you know limited access, as, you know, fine grained access control on your, on your resources to make it as small as possible that you can access it. And then finally, cutting costs. Right, so as you can see from the very first example to the last example, the last example is only doing work when it actually had work to do, right? And because it's buffering it, I can really cheat it with a lot fewer resources, right? Because Airflow is happily able to you know, process the events at its own leisure. I can start to cheat it a little bit where it's saying, well, you know what? I don't need to be able to handle that spike of a thousand objects all at once because Airflow is gonna naturally spread this out over the events that it has access to. It's going to be a lot simpler. I can use a lot smaller airflow cluster. I can use, you know, which at the end, you know, the tasks that I'm running are only running when they need to be. So it's way more efficient, right? And so you're able to, in general, make, you know, more a more efficient holistic system this way without having to over provision, which we've all been guilty of doing. We have to like, you know, I, I don't know. I have to provision this because sometimes there's going to be a thousand files. And I have to provision it for that. If you architect it this way, you don't need that, right? You only need to have, okay, what's my average? On average, I'm doing 1,000 an hour, so therefore all I need is enough resources that it gets it done within that time. So before I move on, I don't want to steal too much thunder of what Airflow 3 is doing up, but there is, uh, I mentioned this in the panel this morning too, Airflow 3 is gonna inherently understand event-driven. Right, I've got uh, AIP 82, which uh, Vincent, you're somewhere, I thought you saw somewhere in the room, right? Vincent, there he is, right there. 
Vincent's the original author of this, but of course, like everything else is, uh, you know, is weighed in. So, I, first of all, I encourage folks to read this AIP. Everyone has access to, is everyone familiar with the AIP process, the uh, Airflow Improvement Proposals? Basically, this is a way for, for the community to discuss general improvements. So one of the general improvements in Airflow 3 is to understand event-driven scheduling natively. So you'll need fewer of those components. I had to put a lot of other components and string them together to make Airflow do what I wanted it to do. Airflow is going to have more capacity to do this inherently in it at that time. So I encourage folks to go ahead and, and read what's in here because uh, there's some really interesting, you know, some, some ideas and it's a great point for discussion. There'll be a huge, uh, I think tomorrow morning is the Airflow 3 panel. So, you know, look into this if you have questions about how Airflow is going to handle event-driven processing uh, in, in version 3. You know, please weigh in on that. Ask some questions tomorrow. Ask some hard questions. That, oh, is it Thursday? That's right, you're on it. Okay, yes. Thursday is the Airflow 3 panel. My apologies. So, yes, on Thursday, it gives you even more time. I, you know, put a bunch of tough questions for these folks so when they go in there, they got to answer them. I'm not going to be on that panel, so I can say that. You know, but this is inherently in there. And so, you know, there's a lot of, you know, we're seeing a lot more of, of folks trying to build these sort of efficient, elastic, modular systems that handle this in a lot better way. And, you know, really encourage you to, again, don't, you know, my, my code notwithstanding, but at least, you know, play with the concepts, play with the ideas, especially really play with the data set stuff. That is fantastic. It works really well. Um, you know, it is, I, it's even better in Airflow. I was running this on 2.9. It's even better in 2.10. Uh, there's also improvements about the, the dynamic task mapping where you can come up with custom names for each of the, the tasks and things like that. There's a lot of improvements, so look at those things as well. And play around with this because there's a way, you know, you can leverage these techniques and it's not necessarily going to apply to every single workflow you build. There, you know, Airflow's bread and butter is still going to be run this ETL job every, every morning at 8 o'clock. That, that's, you know, that, that's, that's its day job. But by leveraging this, you can start to expand. We talked about it a little bit in the panel this morning too, right? The idea that Airflow can do so much more than ETL and traditional data pipelines, right? It's so much more powerful and so much more flexible, really leveraging it for some of these capabilities that maybe, you know, back 10 years ago when Maxime invented this thing, he probably would have never thought of this stuff. Or, you know, full credit, he, maybe he did. He, he just didn't have time to write, write that into it. But regardless, Airflow now can actually handle this at a, a, you know, a, a lot more use cases that maybe you weren't aware of that it can handle. You know, I still don't think Airflow is necessarily going to process somebody's you know, click to buy button, but maybe it could, right? With, as, as it's evolving, maybe it's going to get into even more use cases like that. But in the meantime, you can start to, to leverage and maximize the use and, and the modularity of your code to be able to get um, you know, code that's more resilient, more scalable, and gets you from that stone bridge in Verona to the Golden Gate Bridge around the corner.